Hello, welcome to the Royal Rotor, your weekly podcast from ITV News and all things Royal, where you can watch us on YouTube, which you might well be doing if you're seeing this or if you're listening to us, you're clearly listening to us on your favourite podcast platform. We're here every week. We try and publish every Friday. I've just got back from Scotland. I'm in London, as you can probably see. Lizzie, however, is still in Scotland. I think I look a little bit like I'm recording this in a cave, which yeah. I'm not. <laughs> so that's obviously your 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 fancy hotel room with a bit of castle. Is it a castle you're staying in? No, no, just okay. a regular hotel. It's a regular hotel <laughs> in Edinburgh where um, I left that hotel uh, this morning um, at quite early doors, about six o'clock. I'm now in London uh, and I don't mind sharing with you on this uh, podcast because we're all friends. Um, I'm here because I've got to do lunchtime news today because there wasn't anyone else to do it. Otherwise, um, I might still be in Scotland with uh, Lizzie. Anyway, why were we in Scotland, Lizzie? We were in Scotland because uh, Prince William... Uh, was representing the Queen this week as Lord High Commissioner of uh, the uh, Church of Scotland. <laughs> it's, a long, it's a long title, isn't it? I was title. writing it down the other day and I was thinking, the Lord High Commissioner to the General Assembly of the Church of Scotland or something, isn't it? That's right. So um, yes. he, uh, he and the Duchess of Cambridge were up here for a week in total. He was here for um, three days before the Duchess arrived on Monday, and then they had um, the rest of the week together doing a series of engagements around Scotland, uh, seeing different um, different issues that obviously mean a lot to them. Yes, we'll, we'll talk about all of those uh, in due course, of course. Um, and yes, I think the best place, to, the best way to sum up the week is it's actually, it's a it's a position, the Lord High Commissioner's position, uh, which is meant to link church and state because the Queen isn't the head of the Church of Scotland in the way that she is the head of the Church uh, of England. And she appoints someone each year to attend the General Assembly of the Church of Scotland on her behalf. This year was Prince William, but he also then used that week to go and do a lot of things in Scotland that he wanted to do and things that are close to both his heart and both to, uh, and to Kate's heart as well. Yeah, so we saw them doing a whole range of things. There was the very uh, ceremonial uh, side of the visit, um, where you saw them, uh, him at the um, the Church of Scotland at the General Assembly, and then there were visits that, um, as you say, were um, linked to issues that they are very, uh, very involved with. Whether that's from um, mental health, uh, the environment, um, there was a tennis engagement, there were youth engagements, there were um, things to do with Kate's photography project, um, a whole range of uh, different issues that they saw. Uh, across Scotland, across the week. So this thing that we do every week, uh, we do this Robinson's Royal Rundown. Is there a rundown to Royal Lee Robinson uh, this week because it was all in Scotland or were there another couple of things? Um, oh, uh, just Eden, another uh, couple of... Was, uh, yeah, do you want to do your Ro Robinson's Royal Rundown? It might be a very short one this week, but uh, nevertheless. Yeah, so there's only three things on it this week. The first is obviously Scotland Week, which has got lots of elements to it that we can take you through. And um, the other two bits, the Queen uh, visited uh, HMS Queen Elizabeth uh, on Saturday. And also we had a really, uh, really good news from the medical detection dogs this week, which uh, the Duchess of Cornwall is patron of. Yes, and actually I saw, just saw some pictures of the Duchess of Cornwall out with the Prince of Wales yesterday. And one place that they went to was the Prince of Wales pub. Uh, and if you look on our um, Instagram page, because that's the place I direct you when you can't see pictures because you're listening to this, at ITV News Royals, you'll see a picture of the Prince of Wales pulling a pint in the Prince of Wales. Yeah, and trying to, trying to drink a pint uh, under his mask, which... Um, as we all know, kind of trying to negotiate masks it's, is the it's easiest. Pretty, pretty hard. Yeah, there's also a picture of you. Um, we'll show you it now if you're watching on YouTube, but it's on my Twitter. It's the uh, Prince of Wales standing outside a barber's and I couldn't resist the joke. Uh, he's going for an air cut. The heir to the throne is going for an air cut. Anyway, um, it's, all, it's, it's all in the writing. Uh, <laughs> I apologise in advance. I just think before we get into Scotland's a big long list. So before we get to Scotland then uh, and, and important stuff that we need to cover, shall we just quickly tick off the Queen from the list then? Oh, you start, start at the top. Let's start at the top of the family. Start with and, the boss. Let's start with the boss. The boss lady was on the boat. I get told off for saying that actually because it is a shit. Well. An aircraft carrier. It's quite a big thing, actually. Uh, there are two new aircraft carriers. One's called HMS Queen Elizabeth. The other's called HMS uh, Prince of Wales. 
and HMS Queen Elizabeth is the first one, um, just been built. The UK has been without an aircraft carrier for about a decade. But anyway, uh, it's off to the Far East, to the South China Sea or something. So the Queen was basically saying goodbye to it and had a little, um, had a little tour on the ship named after herself. Yeah, HMS Queen Elizabeth, which was in Portsmouth when she went for the visit, and she was um, bidding uh, farewell to them ahead of the ship's uh, maiden operational deployment. So uh, she met uh, people from the Navy, the RAF and the Marines, and they're working alongside uh, US Marines. So, um, so she got to see them on Saturday. And looking um, pretty well, uh, you know, this is her first visit outside of uh, Zoom, as it were, or whatever they use, WebEx or something, don't they? Um, but this was her first sort of in-person visit, of course, since the uh, death of the Duke of Edinburgh. And most people were remarking on, you know, back to duty, looking, looking well, obviously 95 now, but uh, yeah, uh, looking very good. Yes, yeah, so um, she's obviously been continuing with her audiences remotely from Windsor Castle. Um, and we also saw her conduct that ceremonial duty when she did the state opening of Parliament. But this is sort of her first um, out and about public engagement back to business as normal. And we said, didn't we, that we expected her um, to return to engagements, yeah. uh, putting duty first, as she has done throughout her entire reign. So I think... Yeah. No surprise, but actually a really nice link that it's her sort of first proper engagement had a link to the Navy, which was obviously uh, so close to Philip's heart. Of course, we know that uh, Prince Philip served on uh, Royal Navy ships during the Second World War uh, himself. It's probably worth uh, just pointing out, because you mentioned the uh, Zoom calls or the virtual audiences on our um, Instagram page, we'll show you it here, is the picture of the Queen. Uh, this is the audiences that she does. I think this week she met a couple of ambassadors. One was from, oh, I forget now, Cambodia, I think. Um, anyway, I would, I'd, I'd give you the list. It's, it's on our Instagram page. Go and, go and have a look. Um, but we also hear that the Queen might be considering doing a few more engagements. She's done, what, a couple this year outside of uh, Windsor Castle. But um, we hear that actually Buckingham Palace are looking at how they might sort of expand her role slightly, maybe even make Trooping the Colour, which is sort of the mini Trooping at Windsor this year, maybe make it slightly bigger than it was last year. Yeah, I think, you know, the, the UK is beginning to open up as uh, COVID restrictions lift, which means that uh, the Queen and members of the royal family can uh, get out and about a bit more and do a bit more, which, of course, for them, you know, I think uh, being able to see people face to face is really important. And they've, they've all been very keen to uh, to return to um, to being able to do that. So I think as and when they can, we will see. Uh, we will see more of them and that will include the Queen. So let's go from boss lady then to boss lady's grandson and talk about the week that uh, William had in Scotland and the five days or four days that Kate had in Scotland with William. We should probably, Lizzie, shouldn't we just start by shouting out hello to, was it Katie who we met at the bottom of the Royal Mile just outside the <laughs> Palace of Holyrood House who came up to uh, me and thee and said that she enjoyed the podcast? Yes, so hello to Katie and thank you for... Um, coming to say hello to us. It was nice to meet you. Yes, absolutely. And uh, thank you for anyone who manages to get through this podcast every week, because I think you always deserve a medal. I said it at, this, at the end of last week's very long uh, episode that you all deserve um, a, a medal. So, um, Scotland, let's have a listen to a bit of William's speech. Now, the, the speech that he made to open the General Assembly, um, were, there was a nod, wasn't there, Lizzie, to this whole independence debate. It's been a big part of the Scotland's election campaigns that they had when... Uh, Scotland was electing new members of the Scottish Parliament. Uh, independence was front and centre of that debate. So William didn't say the word independence as such, but you'll hear he did say that he, he was going to, in Scotland, keep his eyes and his ears open. It is my duty today to speak, but equally, I am here to listen. In Scotland this week, I will have my eyes and ears permanently open. There's so much to see and to hear about. The way faith manifests itself in people's everyday lives and in the very work of the Church of Scotland. And the challenges and opportunities faced by people, old and young, and their hopes and aspirations for the future. 
so I spent the morning, so interestingly you said that because I spent the morning sort of trying to sort of create the record about what happened yesterday and the last day when he met Gordon Brown, the former UK Prime Minister, who's also passionately supporting Scotland staying in the United Kingdom. Uh, and there's a lot of controversy about whether or not he should have met him. But the court circular clearly shows that he also met Nicola Sturgeon, who wants to the Scotland to leave the United Kingdom and be an independent country. Uh, so he kind of met both sides and I, I was trying to work out where the controversy was and I couldn't really find it. Yeah, it's not only did he... Private audiences with, with Nicholas Durge and Gordon Brown. Where's the issue? Yeah, and he also, um, we should also point out that he met uh, Alistair Carmichael, who is the Lib Dem MP for Orkney and uh, Shetland. And we were told by a spokesperson for Kensington Palace that during his time here, he spoke to a broad range of people from different communities including politicians from across the political spectrum which is if you look at it on paper he did meet politicians from across the uh, across the political spectrum he met Nicola Sturgeon, Gordon Brown and Alistair Carmichael so I don't think it was uh, it's not one isolated uh, person and, 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 and both <laughs> Nicola Sturgeon's uh, meeting and Gordon Brown's meeting were both on the court circular um, they weren't publicized in advance we should point out and some people are asking well why not but these were sort of private audiences perhaps one of the issues was that Channel 4 News yesterday our colleagues uh, in this building here at ITN also said that they were stopped from filming outside the palace of Holyrood House and I suppose people might ask well why would they they were we saw didn't we yesterday people outside with their cameras filming beating the retreat as William departed so why wouldn't a a broadcaster um you know a reputable broadcaster be allowed to film in a public place outside the palace of Hollywood house Question I mean it's, it's tricky isn't it because um uh, we weren't there we didn't have the conversations we don't know what footage they got how they got it so I think it's quite a tricky one to yeah. comment on as ever with Twitter, though, um, people are flowing accusations all around the place that Prince William was trying to have a private meeting with a member of the campaign group who wants to save the union. And then, whoa, boom, it doesn't take much, does it, on Twitter for the whole world to start sort of throwing abuse at one another because you're either for independence or against independence. And anyway, uh, royals don't like getting involved in political matters. Um, so I don't think they would have much enjoyed that little uh, that little escapade shall we put it but should we focus on the things that he uh, was in Scotland to talk about um, and you know a lot of the issues I mean we could rattle through them quite quickly but but you know there was the mental health in football that William thinks um, you know footballers and football clubs can play a very big part in tackling the conversation on mental health you went to Kate's uh, LTA the Lawn Tennis Association you know similar there they did um, violence reduction they did uh, drug deaths in Scotland Scotland has a particular problem with drug deaths um, you know 1200 in a year it's, it's the worst rate in the world um, they looked at climate change on the Orkney Isles which is one of the most northerly places in the UK it, quite a wide-ranging uh, visit wasn't it including going to St Andrews where the two of them first met yeah, some, um, some great pictures from uh, St Andrews. They met some young carers on West Sands Beach where they did some land yachting, which, uh, which looks very good fun. I think yeah. I'd quite like to come back and give that a go. Um, and then they also met uh, students at St Andrews, which is where they obviously uh, first met 20 years ago. Yes, yes. No, I was at St Andrews, so so the, the, it was a windy, windy old day. So that land yachting, and um, we'll we're, we're, we'll be showing you the pictures right now if you're watching this on YouTube. If you're not, you know where to go. The Instagram page, blah blah blah. Um, but that land yachting looked like a lot of fun, didn't it? Um, whizzing about on the beach uh, on the sand. Uh, but St Andrews, just to tell people, is a university, it's Scotland's oldest university. It's it's on the coast of Fife, so on the other side of the uh, water from Edinburgh. Um, a pretty, I wouldn't say a remote place, but, a, you know, a pretty um, w windy place, I would say, having been there. And it was raining when they were there as well. But it was a kind of place where William and Kate were allowed to be left alone. And we should probably therefore show you the pictures of what William looked like when he went to uh, St Andrews University. Floppy head, fresh face. Have a look at these pictures. Uh, this is him walking down the street after his father dropped him off in 2001. And of course, it was where the where the romance began, began, where a future king and queen were to meet and um, start their relationship. Yeah, and he um, he referred to that in his uh, opening speech at the General Assembly of the Church of Scotland, how uh, how they were at St Andrews and how he was so thankful to be uh, left alone by the town to sort of enjoy his his university years there. 
And um, he also talked about in that speech how it was quite personal, actually, some of it yeah. talking about... You mean the how, way he said the saddest of times and the happiest of times, Scotland? Yeah, he said, um, you know, source of some of his happiest memories, uh, you know, the, the joy in meeting uh, uh, Catherine at St Andrews, his childhood full of holidays there, his grandmother relishing uh, every minute there, his father enjoying walking in the hills, but also some of his saddest memories because it was, of course, at Balmoral where he found out that his... Uh, mother had died. Scotland is incredibly important to me and will always have a special place in my heart. I've been coming to Scotland since I was a small boy. As I grew up, I saw how my grandmother relishes every minute she spends here. And my father is never happier than walking among the hills. My childhood was full of holidays, having fun in the fresh air, swimming in locks, family barbecues with my grandfather in command, and yes, the odd midge. I spent four very happy and formative years studying in St Andrews. The town and the students left me alone to get on with student life, allowing me to share their freedoms and their pubs. I did training as a pilot in Inverness. As well as enjoying the camaraderie of my colleagues, it was a privilege to see the majestic sights of Scotland from the air. In short, Scotland is the source of some of my happiest memories, but also my saddest. I was in Balmoral when I was told that my mother had died. Still in shock, I found sanctuary in the service at Crathy Kirk that very morning. And in the dark days of grief that followed, I found comfort and solace in the Scottish outdoors. As a result, the connection I feel to Scotland will forever run deep. So I, that was where he was speaking about Scotland personally. He also did uh, did something not dissimilar in the speech he made at the end, wouldn't it, at the closing session of the uh, of the General Assembly. But uh, no, they had a very happy time, by all accounts, in St Andrews. We spoke to some of the um, students there, um, and one of them told me that you could almost do a guided tour of St Andrews of the places where William and Kate used to go and have a coffee. So just have a listen to a couple of the students we spoke to. Thank you find out where their, their flats used to be, which halls they were in, it's always discussed. Right, there was there a guided tour of St Andrews <laughs> of places where William and Kate used to live? Yeah, there probably could be. Um, in cafes, there's signs that, you know, Will and Kate used to go here for coffee. I think it was Will said that you either leave St Andrews married or an alcoholic. <laughs> I'm not one of them, but I'm definitely leaning towards one of them. So. <laughs> I won't ask which one. <laughs> yeah. And the principal, the vice chancellor of the university, told me that actually it is a place where, where Prince William was allowed to, as far as was possible, to, to be left alone. And, and I think she said that being a, uh, being a student's a great leveller because everyone's kind of treated the same. This is what um, the principal of St Andrews told me. One of the things that um, the Duke really enjoyed about St Andrews was that it treated him as much as it could like anybody else, like any other student. So you said um, earlier about how you could do a tour almost of yeah. St Andrews based on where Kate and William had been, but you um, you went to one of the places that they had dinner, didn't you? When well, they I think, there? Yeah, by all accounts, they managed to have a bit of a sort of romantic night out. So the kids are sort of were, were left at home uh, in London, so they were still at school. Uh, William and Kate were here from like Monday through Thursday. I can't remember when they went home last night or Friday morning. Um, but they so they got a night out in St Andrews at the, at the university. So we just popped into the um, restaurant uh, on the one of the main streets in St Andrews, Market Street, I think it was. Uh, a lovely place, by the way. I, I thoroughly recommend going there. Um, I was told that uh, William had a beef bourguignon, Kate had a steak. Uh, there was a, obviously a couple of security people in there as well, but they kind of sat at the back in the corner, very much uh, left alone. And I did wonder if it was a place that they had fond memories of going to when they were students, but I was told this restaurant I didn't open until 2013. So uh, no, they don't really have any, you know, they've never been there before. They just fancied a, a night out and, a, and, a, and a, a nice meal in a restaurant. So good on And them. who can blame them? I mean, I think we're all enjoying that after lockdown. Yeah. And they're, um, you know, he, he described it as a walk down memory lane and I'm sure it brought back a lot of happy memories for them um, being being back there. Yes, absolutely. Um, I, I did make a rather a cheeky reference in the report that we did uh, from St Andrews where we found the barbers and it said St Andrews, a hairdresser or something, student haircuts. 
and I sort of said, well, William probably needed the barbers a bit more often then than he does now, um, which is, you know, as reporters, we like to stick to facts and that's probably quite factual. So mean. And we should also say that one of the reasons, I'm going to skip on from that, uh, to say that Just one get involved. Come on, let's join in the debate. One of the uh, reasons they were at St Andrews was, of course, to take a walk down memory lane, but they also wanted to meet uh, the students there and to hear how they'd sort of been supporting each other through the COVID uh, pandemic and how they'd, how they'd been getting on. So yeah. at every visit, I was, it was cleverly done, actually, how there were really good pictures or good stories behind lots of the visits and then serious issues. So whether that yeah. was the land yachting, which was great pictures, but the serious issue was meeting the young carers, whether it was on the racetrack at the Knock Hill Racing Circuit of him in that uh, test driving the vehicle, oh, he yeah. was that there looking at sustainable mo mo motorsports. There were good pictures. We should, we, should, we should have a look at that picture of him with a with a helmet on. You could just about see his 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 eyes poking out of the of the helmet, and that was all about uh, racing cars powered by electricity to sort of try and show how far electric cars have come. And similarly, when they were at uh, Heavy Sound, which was part, they're partnered with the Scottish Violence Reduction Unit. So they're working with young people. Um, that was where Kate did. Uh, so it was a very serious issue. The good picture was Kate doing the, uh, the DJing when William said, you are hurting my ears. <laughs> Yeah, and exactly. You're you're right, actually, because um, you know, the early years is something that we've covered on this podcast before. Uh, that Kate had that big report out, didn't she? Was it at the end of last year when it, it was about how what happens in your first five years of life affects the next fifty years of your life, and actually how you know it's very important to get the early years right because that really sets people on the right path going forward. So a lot of the work was sort of feeding back into like William's mental health, Kate's early years stuff, where they were looking at violence reduction, looking at the problem uh, of drugs death as well. They were in places like uh, North Lanarkshire, I think just outside uh, Glasgow, where that was a particular problem. And of course, we mentioned the trip they had to the Orkney Isles, where they were looking at, there's the centre there, which is like the only accredited test centre for renewable energy because of the, you can imagine in the Orkney Isles in the North Sea, the, the, the swell of tidal power and, and how Orkney is trying to become self-sufficient in its electricity generation. Yeah, they were at the European Marine Energy Centre, which is um, working to support the green recovery. So that's very much uh, part of the work that William particularly has been doing. Uh, you know, he's obviously very interested in uh, the environment and what we can do to correct a lot of um, the mistakes and going forward with his Earthshot Prize the next decade. Yeah. Yeah, oh, and actually, uh, I suppose you, you know, Scotland is going to host this COP26, the UN Climate Change Summit, which is coming up in November. It's happening in Glasgow. So Scotland's going to be the host for that. They haven't told us which royals are going to be involved in it, but I can't see how Prince William and Prince Charles wouldn't be involved, given everything that they we know about their, their passion for and concern for. Uh, the environment and you mentioned William's Earthshot Prize the massive thing he's got going on obviously his father has been campaigning on this for 40 years or so now so uh, I would have thought Lizzie wouldn't you that they would have some involvement um we, we, for example we don't even know what what involvement the royals are going to have with the G7 summit which is coming up in in England in, Corn in Cornwall in a few weeks time uh, we've got some suspicions but we can't tell you them um but uh you know, for, I would have thought that the, the COP26 climate change summit in Scotland will involve the royals in some form. Yeah, I mean, as you say, for, for Prince William and Prince Charles, this is top of their agenda almost, isn't it? I mean, it, it's um, not even almost, it is top of their agenda. It's uh, an issue that they both care deeply about and, uh, you know, doing a lot of work uh, on at the moment. So we should probably talk about Mila Sneddon, shouldn't we? We should talk about Mila Sneddon. I mean, one of our favourite um, stories. One of our favourite stories. And um, yeah, it was a really special day yesterday getting to see the family again. And uh, I think a very special day for them, not to see us, but to see somebody else. 
Yes. Um, so, she, I mean, do, do you want reminded of the Mila Stedden story? Uh, if you're on this podcast, you would have known about it. So this was a girl that ITV News first met last year during the first coronavirus lockdown when she had to be isolated in her home, separated from her dad who had to move out, as, as did her older sister because of the jobs that they were doing. She has leukemia, being treated for chemotherapy. They couldn't risk her uh, with coronavirus sweeping through the UK. Uh, that in itself was a was a really uh, you know heart rending story, um, but the picture that the mum took we've shown you that picture before, but here it is again. That's uh, the picture that Linda, the mum, took through the kitchen window. That became part of Kate's Hold Still exhibition, one of the hundred finalists. And then they had a phone call, which we told you about a little while ago. And, uh, uh, Mila was on this very podcast, and what happened in uh, the Palace of Hollywood House this week? She got to have, Mila got to have tea with a real life princess, in her words, in a real castle, as she said yesterday. Let's uh, have a look at the picture. Look at you. I want to give a big squeeze of cuddle. It's so nice to meet you in person. I love your dress. You do look fab. <laughs> Wowzers. And your shoes. And this, you got to have a chat with um, Mila inside. You were lucky enough to get inside. I was um, locked outside the gates because they had to have, you know, so few people in the room. Um, but you got to have a little chat with Mila, didn't you? I did, yeah. I got to see her uh, straight after that meeting uh, with the Duchess. And um, in case you couldn't quite hear that conversation, uh, when Kate walked into the room wearing a, a pink dress, I'll say the words, Chris, she was in a pink dress. Pink dress. Um, as as promised to Mila on that phone call, you know, she said that if, if they ever- What's your favourite colour? Mila said pink. Yeah. Mila's favourite colour. Well, what, I like, what I like is that Mila actually said to Kate, are you wearing a costume? By which she probably meant the kind of pink dress that, that not Cinderella, because she's blue from what I remember of Disney films. Who wears pink? Um, Sleeping Beauty, for example. The kind of dress that a, a Sleeping Beauty Disney princess would wear. It wasn't quite that one. She didn't just pop down to the supermarket and get a fancy dress, pink dress. But nevertheless, she did honour the promise that she made to Mila to wear pink. Uh, so they had they had their meeting, their tea. The cameras were allowed to capture just a little bit of that. And then um, afterwards, I got to sit down with Mila and her family. And uh, Mila just, I mean, she was just so giddy with excitement. She said it was just so good and that she had never in her life met a real life princess before. That was so good, I've never met a real princess in my life before. She really wanted to meet me. Because Daddy had to self-isolate but to keep me safe from the coronavirus. Um, and I, we spoke to the mum and dad outside, because it's actually important to say to everyone, yes, she's having chemotherapy, still having chemotherapy. She had a little sort of um, hiccup a couple of weeks ago when she got croup and had to be in hospital. Uh, and um, mum and dad, Linda and Scott, were telling me that she's, you know, little Mila's got another 10 months of treatment ahead of her, but they're looking ahead to next March, which is what they said when they can ring the bell and hopefully get to that end, the end of the line there. So um, have a listen to the chat I had with, uh, with Linda and Scott. We're just counting down the months to March next year when she'll ring the bell. So, yeah. And that's the ringing the bell is, yeah. the, is the final, that's what you're all aiming for at the moment, yeah? Absolutely, yeah. It would be really good to get her to the end of that. Yeah. 10 months. They're just the most remarkable family though, aren't they? They're just so yeah. positive and, um, you know, little Mila, she has been through uh, an extraordinary amount in not in her sort of five short years, um, but she has got an incredible spirit. And to finish their day, they got to stay and see beating retreat at the Palace of Holyrood House. And there are some really sweet pictures that we should be able to show you here. They're still Is it beating the retreat or beating retreat. It's beating beating the retreat. retreat, isn't it? Yeah, it's beating retreat. Right. Uh, and uh, they got to see that at the Palace of Hollywood House because obviously they were guests. They were there for the and day. There some, Actually, um, what's, the other, what's the other really interesting thing that Mila told us? That she was asked what it was she wanted to eat when she went to the palace to meet the real life princess. And, and her reply was that she wanted to have some Rice Krispies. So they, they brought in so little packs of mini cereal on a silver tray uh, and they came into the room on a silver tray. I mean, how amazing. I think she just had the, the best day and um, at a beating retreat, there are some lovely images of them sitting 
uh, near the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge and little Mila is sort of waving across and then uh, the Duke and Duchess came over and um, she got to meet William as well. So uh, a lovely, as well, as well as a lovely end to a, a special day for them. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, and uh, we wish them well. We should also mention that uh, in the grounds of the Palace of Holyrood House the other evening, there was a special drive-in cinema uh, oh, for yes. NHS staff. So they did a special... Cruella de Vil. Cruella. The film Cruella. Yes, I forgot yeah. about that. It was a special screening that was kind of in recognition of the, the NHS staff, which goes back to that earlier point of, you know, really great pictures of them all at the drive-in watching the film. The serious issue is recognising the NHS staff who have had, uh, you know, an extraordinarily difficult year. And we should therefore tell you about the car that, or the truck or whatever you call it that William and Kate turned up in it was a 1966 Land Rover that the Queen had lent them for the evening so they could watch the film everyone watched the film from inside their cars not rather than sat, sat on the grass on their blanket um, and it was a 1966 Defender and that that beautiful green colour and that's what they watched it. and there's a lovely picture of the two of them sort of sitting there like this isn't there watching the film lent to them by the Queen and it had belonged to uh, yeah. to the Duke of Edinburgh so um so that was really nice they actually got to meet uh, two of the stars of the film, Emma Stone and Emma Thompson, um, and had a, a chat with them about the about the film and filming outside Buckingham Palace. Um, uh, it's probably worth having a listen to that little chat because um, Emma Stone was saying how actually she was driving round and round. She didn't call it the Queen Victoria Monument, but I presume that's what she meant. She said, I was driving round and round outside the front of Buckingham Palace one Sunday morning. And was it a fun film to, to film? Oh, it was so much fun. We were all over, we were all over London. We were in front of Liberty. They transformed what is it, Carnaby Street? Into yeah. 70s London, yeah. which was amazing. And then um, we were in front of Buckingham Palace at one point. I was riding a motorcycle around yeah. the mall. We should, we should have had you stopped, Emma. It's very dangerous. I know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I really got away with it. It was yeah. incredible. <laughs> On my motorcycle, being trail, a car trailing me around Buckingham Palace. In a crazy outfit. Yeah. In a crazy yeah. outfit. Makeup just really. smeared down my face, black and white hair. It was insane. So let's um, let's fly metaphorically from Scotland to uh, England, where uh, Charles and Camilla were. We mentioned them at the top of the programme, the air cut and the pulling the pint in the pub, but also uh, an update on a charity very close to Camilla's heart. Yeah, the uh, medical detection dogs, which uh, the Duchess of Cornwall is patron of. It is, uh, we have covered the medical detection dogs a number of times um, on the news and on this podcast. And uh, these are super, super clever dogs. And they are so clever that results of a trial have shown that they can detect COVID. And not only can they detect it, they can detect it 94.3% of the time when it's present. And equally importantly, they can also detect with really, really high accuracy when COVID isn't present. So they know when it's there and when it's not there. And this means that the dogs can now essentially be trained to work in public settings to mass screen people. So this could be, I think it was described to us at one stage that this could potentially be a game changer. Yeah, yeah and, and that doesn't travel. surprise me at all, yeah. Having seen the dogs, you know, having seen how they work, having seen what they can do. We saw them at the train station, Paddington train station. They've done simulations at the airport. I mean, you could literally have a plane load of people get off the plane and a dog could run along and like basically sniff everyone and tell them whether or not they've got COVID, even if that person has no idea and has no symptoms. It's remarkable. And you could see that working in sort of, like you say, airports, train stations, uh, sports venues, music venues, anywhere where there's sort of a mass event of people and these dogs can, you know, can get around a lot of people quite quickly. It could be, um, it could be, yeah, a game changer. And before we go, we should probably leave you with what I think are some of the nicest pictures that I've taken from my phone uh, in Scotland, because uh, while we were there, I managed to get up to uh, Arthur's Seat, which is that sort of rocky, craggy, very tall, impressive looking bit of geology, uh, very close to Edinburgh. Um, and we're going to leave you just with the pictures that I took from up there, which I put on my social media. Um, great to have you with us. Thank you for watching and listening uh, from everyone in Scotland, England, Wales, Northern Ireland, and anywhere else in the world where you're watching or listening to this podcast. We will see you uh, next week or the week after. Mm -hmm.